How's it going guys, Vapov here, and I've been using the M1 Mac Mini for about two months now, just shy of two months, and I've gotta say, this thing's really swayed me into the direction of Mac OS, which I thought I'd never say considering I've been a Windows OS fanboy for pretty much the rest of my life. And this is a very dangerous situation to be in considering Apple's ecosystem is notoriously expensive and that's something I cannot afford. In fact, that's the primary reason why I went with the base M1 Mac mini with eight gigabytes of RAM and 256 gigabytes of storage. I felt like this was the best value for money product you can get from Apple when you also get Apple selling $700 wheels. So. That's the primary reason I went with the Mac Mini, but there are other reasons, including port selection as well as size. Let's start off with size, where I think this thing is pretty much the perfect companion to be propped into any setup. You could store it under your monitor, you could store it under your desk, in a cabinet, things can go on and on. There's been tons of different setup videos on how you can do so. I'll link a few down in the description if you really wanna check it out. But the other main reason for going with the Mac mini is port selection. If you take, let's say a MacBook Pro or a MacBook Air, the ports you get are very limited, Type-C USB, as well as the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. Whereas on the Mac mini, you get all of those ports any type A USB port selection, you get HDMI and you get ethernet. So these are really important ports for me. And you could say, or you could argue that you can get all of these with a dongle. But for me, dongles don't really do full justice to my experience. So I'm the type of guy who uses a type A USB microphone. And let's say I wanted to connect this microphone to a MacBook Pro or a MacBook Air, I need a dongle. Well, connecting it to a dongle basically makes the signal go through the computer into the dongle and then to my microphone. And that results in just the slightest audio quality losses, which I cannot deal with when compared to, let's say, connecting the microphone straight to a device. And with the advantage of doing that with the M1 Mac mini, the primary reason I went for it was that. Now I know you can get better dongles, more expensive dongles that avoid all of these issues. But personally, as someone who was just trying out the Mac OS experience, I didn't really wanna invest in, let's say a more expensive dongle, and then let's say not being happy with Mac OS and then ending up returning everything that I had purchased. So to avoid all of that, I went with the M1 Mac mini and hope that makes sense. So how is the M1 processor? Well, with my initial setup out of the way, I felt Mac OS had things that were really out of place. So it did take a while for me to adjust to things coming from Windows. Yes, I had experienced Mac OS in the past and Big Sur doesn't really seem like a big departure from any of the other Mac OS software generations out there. I could be blatantly wrong and Apple fanboys can come at me at the comments down below. But to me, Mac OS just seems like Mac OS from the past and adjusting after a few days was kind of natural. And this is me being a tech savvy person. So people who aren't very tech savvy may not be able to adjust the way I did. But personally, I felt no issues with this thing. So for me, I use the snipping tool a lot on Windows. And this was really easy for me on Mac OS. You could just use Control Shift 3 or Control Shift 4. And speaking of control, I think one of the biggest changes you'd need to live with is uh, the fact that there's a command button on Mac OS. I don't know why there's a command button on Mac OS. Again, you can explain to me why that is in the comments down below. But the primary change I made was changing the control to the command button and that made everything seamless. So I just pretty much avoid the command button and just use the control button as the command button and that's a-okay. One thing I did miss from Windows on Mac OS was the ability to resize Windows. This is something that isn't native on Mac OS, which I found surprising. But to be honest, you could just install any program. I installed something called Tiles, and that basically allowed me to distribute my screen with two windows or four windows or three windows the way I like on Windows. And that's how I made this experience tailored to me. Speaking of download, that's one of the biggest challenges of the M1 Mac. See, on the M1 Mac, you can either run an Intel-based program or an ARM-based program, depending on whether or not the software supports it. And yes, you can run Intel-based programs. I've had no trouble running things like Audacity or Epic Games Launcher even, but the problem is it's not gonna give you the best performance. And number two, it relies on something called Rosetta. Now, 
Notoriously, Rosetta has resulted in performance drops. And yes, you do face performance drops when you're using Intel-based programs, but I feel like the performance drops are nothing like we've had in the past. So once you download an Intel-based program for the very first time on your Mac machine, it's basically gonna prompt you to download Rosetta, which you can do. And once you're done, everything else is taken care of in the background. So every time you download another Intel-based program, things work as butter and you never get reminded of Rosetta. And this is something I talked about in my initial impressions video of the M1 Mac Mini as well, but things like running Intel-based and ARM-based programs have been completely a breeze. As great as the M1 Mac Mini sounds and is, you will face a few optimization problems. I faced that with Chrome where I ran the Intel-based Chrome for the first few days of using the M1 Mac Mini and things were a nightmare. I faced a lot of force closes, a lot of issues, but ever since that I've switched over to the ARM-based version of Chrome and things have been excellent. And yes, I'm the type of guy who uses Chrome over Safari, just deal with it. I wouldn't say all Intel-based programs are bad though. I've been running Audacity for let's say two months and there's been absolutely no problem, but the M1 optimized version of any program is going to run better. And if you've missed my previous testing videos where I've tested Handbrake, the result between the Intel and M1 version of Handbrake is about a 40% increment when running the ARM version. So there is a definite improvement when running the ARM version. And that's the most optimal use case for this M1 Mac mini or any M1 running device in general. There have been improvements with Adobe Premiere Pro as well with the M1 version currently out there, but it's still very much so in its beta stage. So it does require a lot more fine tuning to make sure it can be used on, let's say, a very high level of production. And let's take Final Cut Pro or DaVinci Resolve, one of the first programs to ever get optimized for the M1 architecture. You can edit 4K as well as 8K footage without having to have any problems whatsoever, but these are facing problems too recently. So I don't know how the whole ordeal with the M1 architecture really is. As far as Adobe Premiere Pro goes, simple videos are really easy to edit. You can do so without facing any issues, but more complex timelines, let's say, camera comparisons or reviews, these are going to be more strenuous. And this is something that you need to keep in mind. This isn't going to replace your high-end PC, but this may very well give you 70% of the power of the high-end PC. And yes, the 30% extra is not gonna come from any hardware. So even with 16 gigabytes of RAM on the M1 MacBook Pro that I had for maybe a day or two, I did notice timeline issues on Adobe Premiere Pro. The other 30% improvement I feel is gonna come from software optimization. And that's really the basis of the M1 architecture in my opinion. Also, I just wanna point out that when rendering a video on let's say Premiere Pro, I couldn't edit a photo on Photoshop simultaneously and make a thumbnail because that just led to a lot of lag, a lot of strenuous performance, animations were choppy, etc. And I don't think that really boils down to the M1 architecture. That again boils down to optimization. So this is something that I want to revisit maybe in six to 12 months time because only then will you know the true power and potential of the M1 processor. Again, that's just my opinion. And that's because the other things that I've done on the Mac mini have been ridiculously crazy. So an ARM optimized Chrome, for example, can run up to 50 tabs without any issues. You could have 4K videos, you could have Twitch videos all simultaneously running on this thing and this thing won't even budge. So again, I think the core message I wanna get across to anyone who's looking to purchase an M1 Mac or an M1 Mac mini, even with eight gigabytes of RAM is perhaps consider 16 gigabytes, but also consider the fact that the majority of the performance boost you're gonna get is when the programs that you wanna run on the Mac mini are going to be optimized with the ARM version. In fact, I've run Windows 10 on the Mac mini using Parallels. This is something that was a first for me. I've never done it in the past. And if you wanna see more specifics on how to do this, or maybe some very specific things on Windows running on Mac OS via Parallels on an M1 architecture, let me know in the comments down below because I'll be really, really happy to try it out. As with everything though, things aren't as fine and dandy all the time. So yes, as I mentioned, you have to wait for the ARM-based version of your program to really test out the performance of the M1 Mac mini. But if I was to change one of the things that I have that I could have gotten better was maybe switch to 16 gigabytes of RAM to make this machine more future-proof. That's just my opinion. Maybe with 16 gigabytes of RAM, this thing will run more efficiently, more smoothly. And maybe then I'd be able to do multiple things simultaneously. And 
For those people who think this can replace your 16 inch MacBook Pro, I really don't think so because I feel like when it comes to GPU processing, this thing is still lacking and I've made a video separately on this. If you want to check that out, I'll leave a card above on screen just at this very moment. There's also wider problems with the M1 Mac mini that not many people may address, but I do want to address them for those specific people who might want to get the M1 Mac mini for that use case. So number one, there's no 10 gigabit uh, data transfer speeds with the Ethernet port on the M1 Mac Mini. You can't really change the RAM or storage variant once you've purchased the M1 Mac Mini, so you're stuck with what you have. And I think the biggest of them all is Bluetooth. This is something that I found out through Patrick's video, which I'll leave a card above, but basically the Bluetooth connectivity on the M1 Mac Mini or pretty much any Mac Mini chassis isn't really up there. So it's basically resulting in a lot of connection loss and data loss. And this is something that I know many of you guys cannot deal with. I didn't face this issue for about three weeks until I was using the M1 Mac Mini. And that's why I wait so long before reviewing these products. But yeah, the Bluetooth connectivity issues basically made my wireless headphones as well as my wireless mouse very much unusable to use. In fact, so unusable that I switched to wired headphones as well as a wired mouse because I just like the M1 Mac Mini too much. But I can see how this could be a really big problem for those people who are very much invested into the wireless ecosystem. I know Kevin is and maybe for that reason you could end up returning the M1 Mac Mini because let's say if your keyboard, your speakers, your mice, they don't work wirelessly and they result in a ton of data connection issues that might not seem like a big deal to you watching but once that accumulates it could really become very annoying. So that leaves me with 85% positive feelings about the M1 Mac Mini and 15% negative feelings about the M1 Mac Mini. As someone who can learn and adapt to a lot of workflows, can learn new things very quickly, I feel like this is a great tool for me. I know it has its laggy issues, but as someone who was coming from a device that was worse than this when it came to lag, this is a great substitute. I know this isn't going to be the one for, let's say, people who run a lot of Intel-based programs, AutoCAD, simulation software, games, in fact. I think for those people, the M1 processor might be something you want to skip altogether and only look into it once you get, let's say, the next generation or once you start seeing more support for the M1 architecture. On the other hand, if you're the type of person who uses Safari a lot, Final Cut Pro, basically the Apple ecosystem in its full force, this might be the perfect solution for you because not only do you get the best of portability, the best of performance, but also the best for value for money as long as you don't move your setup too often. Those were my thoughts on the M1 Mac Mini. I tried to be as inclusive as possible. I tried to test the device from as many test case scenarios as possible. But if you want to see anything in specific, let me know in the comments down below and I'll be sure to look into it. If you like this video, make sure you give it a like rating. And if you want to see more of me, more of my face, more of my reviews, make sure you subscribe to not miss out on future content. Thanks for watching. This is Vabhav and I'll see you in the next one. Adios.